Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. We are doing no intro, no outro, just me and George talking about some books. So welcome to the show, George. The good old days, man. I mean, how many people we have on the show right now? I just love the opportunity to get back on air with you. And it reminds me of probably the very beginning of our time together and, you know, some of the fondest memories I have on the Shared Practices Podcast. Yeah, I, we have not done enough episodes together and every time we do it's like a phenomenal episode and it's like why why had like what was the january was the last time we recorded together yeah i think the world fell apart since then so well but still yeah i mean i feel like oh i think we did a COVID episode somewhere in there maybe yeah COVID yeah related you content. Mean it's some t- something timely at the time yeah, yeah now it's dated yeah, yeah it's all good <laughs> um well uh we're gonna do a book club and this is the new format that we're we've been trying out and Last week got pretty uh, heavy, pretty quick. Uh, my Everyone shot down my book, which was great. And then uh, my dad put everyone into a midlife crisis spin. So um, <laughs> this week, we're not going to do that. But if you missed that one, it, it's it's worth a listen. So you you mentioned this book on um, Dental Friends with Benefits. Correct. And so I was like, oh, perfect. Uh, we should probably have Ashley here, but we don't. Yeah, and we... so. If for those of you who don't know, should we spend a minute or two explaining what Dental Friends with Benefits is? I feel like it's I've, that name. I've mentioned it several times in the last few episodes, actually. Okay. I've been I've been hyping your show for you. Well, I appreciate it. And it's funny, I think the irony of me having a show that's more podcasty than you. Oh. Is, I mean, it is literally everything that you said you hated about podcasts <laughs> when we first started together. You're like, if if I have a podcast, I don't want Five minutes of banter before we get to the content. I now want... there's like 30 minutes of banter an episode. Yeah, that's all it is, is banter. <laughs> I mean, there's you get into like deep, good stuff. But like if someone, filled. if someone was coming, like waiting for a topic, they are like, I want to hear George and Ashley's uh, opinion on this one topic. And they were listening yeah. to that episode and it was George from three years ago. You'd be sitting there with a pen and a piece of paper at your computer listening to it and you'd throw it down on the table and walk away. Yeah, no, I, I would not... And and it took me a while to see the value of this podcast, to be quite frank. Um, but I think the impact that we've had on people's lives in such a short period of time from such a fun show, which also can get really heavy at times, is, yeah, it, I'm totally sold on it, what we're doing over there. Okay, so now that we've undersold it by saying that it's all banter, what, what's been the feedback that you've been getting from Dental Friends with Benefits? Well, I think Ashley and I both, I mean, and how much of it have you listened to, Richard? I listened to the first three, and then I jumped forward to... Uh, the Paul Etchison episode. Got it. And I tried to get to Christine to listen to it. It was actually a breakthrough moment. We kind of got in a fight over it. Uh, sorry, Christine. Um, <laughs> we realized that she doesn't listen. And this, this is going to further prove at this point. She realized that that for her podcast, and especially like my podcast, it's it's socially draining. It's like a It's like a social situation. And she's an introvert. And so it's like, she has to like pay attention and care what's going on and it's kind of stressful and what's Richard going to say next and all this stuff. Yeah. So it is draining for her to listen to my podcast. Uh, and and she liked it, but it was also that same like feeling of, of drainingness. And we just got to a point where I realized like I'm not going to ever try and get Christine to listen to podcasts again. And we're just okay with that. Like I can have a podcast as a business and she never has to listen to it. And that's totally fine. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny. Um, I was married, obviously, not no longer married. And while I was married, my ex-wife did not listen to any of the podcasts. And now after we were divorced, like now she listens. Interesting. And so I think it's funny that, yeah, but I mean, it was never a thing. And it's for that same reason, you know, just personality wasn't yeah. a thing. But I don't think that's like a necessity that your spouse listens no, to your show. No, it doesn't. It's just hard because I'm like so excited about it. Like it's such, Oh, and you want to share? Yeah, I'm a sharer, obviously. Yeah. So it's like, hey... Listen to this really good episode about th- these people talking about these things. Like it was the one about parenting. Oh yeah, and yeah, how yeah. much like parenting sucks and people don't talk about that enough. No, and it's funny because so Ashley and I started the show with the hope of there's so much glorified content out there. Like let's have two people that are willing to get really raw and honest about every part of our life, good and bad. And the show has been really cool. And for me as a guy to get really vulnerable and honest about parts of me that are not very masculine and aren't super proud and, you know, has been, I think people have really resonated with a lot of the things we've talked about. Mm. So it's been really cool and exciting. And uh, I think we've, we've led to a lot of people hiring either therapists, life coaches, stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, looking in the mirror and realizing that maybe everyone has work to do, not just us or you. 
No, it's it's been really good, and I am I'm 100 percent going to listen to all of it and catch up, and not just because occasionally I might come up, but like because <laughs> I actually enjoy it. So I highly recommend Dental Friends with Benefits. Go subscribe, listen to George and Ashley, and uh, uh, you've had some some guests from other podcasts and um, yeah, open up and about some some really good stuff. We got Alan Mead coming up, and we have uh, Paul Edgerson. Yeah, I mean it's just been fun. It's was just been a cool... Joshua Austin was on, right? Yeah, he was on too. Yeah, from Working Interferences. Yeah. So I, I haven't fun. listened to that one. I'm, yes. I'm, uh, was it what episode called Smack That Ash? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I knew that not to share that one with Christine. So that was, <laughs> that was what I knew not to do. Yeah, don't share that one with Christine. Yeah. It is also uh, our unfiltered show. So, yes, it is explicit. Yeah. So brace yourself if if that's a thing for you. Earn the ratings on iTunes. Apparently. So, uh, so this book came up uh, yeah. when you were talking with Ashley. So... The book that I'm a really big fan of, and the audio, it's actually an audio series on Audible. It's not really a book. Uh, it's called Take Control of Your Life by Mel Robbins. And it's something that I've listened to twice in my life in two very distinct times. Mm. Uh, one was maybe two years ago. I was married at the time. Took it in. Don't think I got a whole lot from it. I found it again during COVID. Wait, okay. So I'm really glad you said that because the first time I listened to this, because you've been recommending this to people. The first time I listened to this, because yeah. I've listened to maybe half of it, I wasn't getting a lot out of it. Yeah. Has to catch you at the right time. Okay. Because it was just like the life circumstance of, of these individuals. So it's it's an audible series. It's not a like book that she wrote and then converted into an audiobook. No, it's an audible series. An audible series. Audible is doing this special thing where they're creating original content and um, and it's been really good. A lot of really great authors, really exclusive stuff. So, but it's different than an audiobook. It's more like a glorified podcast. It's yeah, it's very much like a high production podcast. So she interviews. It's like almost like practice underwater. Like she she interviews people um, who she does like life coaching sessions, and then she breaks them down afterwards. And so I guess I feel like context and where I was at in my life in yeah. those two different times would probably be let's do it a big part. So. Um, if you listen to Dental Friends with Benefits, I think you'll learn a lot about, I guess, my experience with anxiety and my relationship with anxiety. And it wasn't, I think the first time I listened to the book, I was ignorant to how big of a role fear and anxiety played in my life. So I sort of, the whole message of the book just flew right over my head mm. of, you know, taking control of fear and your ability to manage the fear response has everything to do with your ability to run a business and be successful. That I missed it the first time. Second time, COVID was an interesting time for me because I really had, I had a lot of time to break through my relationship with anxiety and, and a lot of the things that triggered it and how to manage it. And, you know, I talk about it a lot, but, you know, I think COVID was that time for me to really explore that. I think I read like seven audiobooks or listened to seven audiobooks during that month that I was off. Yeah. Just had a lot of time you know, no kids that often. And so it was just weird for me to have that much time with nothing to do. And so I really just explored that. And then this audiobook was the the thing that I, it just hit me at the right time. Okay. So that's, that's good to know that like uh, this book might not, if you're not in the right headspace, might yeah. not resonate with you. And I think it's important that I back this up. And this is where I almost felt like this is a season five episode that needs to happen to get the book and be able to like take or the audio book and take what you need from it. Yeah. And it's the idea that, and this is something that, you know, through life coaching and therapy, you sort of, you see it happen, but the growth of your business is so closely linked to your personal growth mm. and your ability to understand yourself and to know your responses and to like all of this person. Like, I think I said it on our last season five episode together, like personal development, and leadership development are like, you can't do one without the other. Right. You need them both. And, you know, this book has everything to do with that. You yeah. know, watching yourself as a business owner and how much more effectively you can run a business while, like, because of the fact that you improved as a person. And the second time post divorce, picking up that book again was something that definitely uh, resonated much differently the second time around. So, what does she talk through with people about their anxiety that, that resonated with you? So, the whole point is take control of your life. Okay. And that's like the gist of the book. And the whole concept behind it is, well, if you're letting fear dictate your decision making, then you're not in control of your life. Fear is in control of you. Mm. And so the way to take the grasp on your life and to really own it and run it and be the way you want to be 
is to be able to look fear in the eyes and say, hey, I, I see that I'm scared here. Totally cool. People get scared. And I'm just going to move it to the side and do what I want to do anyway. And it's that idea that you are acting and taking control of the the things in your life. You're empowered in your life by managing that fear and not letting that fear manage you. And so that's really the book in a nutshell. And you go through these people's stories of showing you know, how fear is confronting for them. And there's a lot of, I think, and it's funny, Practice Underwater has been a year now that we've been doing it. And I think the more mindset we get to, the more fear is in every single doc that we talk to, you know, afraid of not being good enough, afraid of their staff leaving them, afraid of being a failure, afraid of everything. And I I don't think, and maybe I'm too far in the camp of this, but I, I truly feel that your ability to manage fear as a leader is one of the biggest skills you could have and one of the largest assets to your business. Mm. So, and 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 I think this is my why I had a hard time with the book was that I didn't feel like I was afraid of stuff when yeah. I was listening to it. And so, how how did you come around to the idea of like maybe there's some fear hidden here that I haven't uncovered or that I'm not recognizing or acknowledged? And and therefore unable to process it moving forward. It's like uh, Richard. Have you ever had? I mean, you've done more clinical dentistry than me. I don't know. We might be tied. No. What do you mean? I'm I I see patients half a day a week right now for the last year and a half, and for like six months of that, I didn't see any patients. So okay. so I'm I'm a year and a half of like half a day a week at this point. Hmm. Okay, maybe. We'll see. But we both have seen patients in our careers. Right. And, you know, you have that denture patient. And they say a lot of the times, man, you took out all my teeth. I didn't realize how much they ached mm -hmm. until they were all gone. You know, it's something we hear a lot from patients that, that is now in dentures where they just had this like chronic ache that's just like kind of latent. They just got used to it. I think that was my relationship with fear at first and anxiety was I just had it all the time. I didn't even notice I had it. I just always felt kind of crappy, but I didn't really know why. Okay. And then it wasn't until I started recognizing for me that there's a body sign. And so for me, it's tightness in my chest. Mm. When I feel tightness in my chest, I learn to, I think the very first time I, I it, it takes a while to click where you're like, oh, I just felt tightness in my chest. I feel that all the time. And it takes just starting to recognize your physiological symptom. And she talks about it a lot, like where you feel fear in your body. And that's like where anxiety shows up in your body. And for me, it's tightness in the chest. Other people, it's pit in the stomach. Some people, it's, you know, shortness of breath, dizzy, lightheaded. You know, there's different physiological symptoms. When something scary happens, notice where you feel it. Mm. Like, I could tell you something right now that would like really freak you out, like an insane amount of debt that you would take on or like you getting a call from one of your business partners saying that this is happening. Right. I could I could do something to you that would stimulate that physiological feeling of fear. For me it's pit pit of the stomach for pit sure. Pit of the stomach. Um and and I used to think that I didn't have anxiety. Like I yeah. I used to think like oh that's not a thing for me. Um or or that sorry. Didn't have much. Um and it recently I've realized that I totally have anxiety around getting stuff done. Yeah. Uh, and that manifests itself in procrastination, but then you feel crappy the whole time you're procrastinating or the moment that you look up from whatever, you know, series you were binge watching or game you were playing or whatever it is that you use to procrastinate and avoid, and then you come out of that and, and you just feel worse because now you've made the situation worse by procrastinating. And so for me, it was numbing out. So yeah. work being at the office used to really be a trigger for me. Mm. And so I would just sit in my practice and just, just sit there and like just feel super anxious and not do any. It was kind of almost paralyzed. Mm. You're almost paralyzed from it. And it wasn't until I started recognizing the physiological symptom. And that's the first step. So for you, it would really be that pit in the stomach, starting to notice it. Oh, I feel a pit in my stomach. Mm. And not just like accepting it, but like Noting being it. very intentional about noticing it. That's the first step. And I think once you have that physiological symptom and you know where you feel it and you can recognize it throughout your life, then the audiobook means a lot more mm. because then you've acknowledged that you have an issue with fear. Like I would just assert that you have an issue with fear of not getting stuff done. There's something attached to that. There's some meaning that that makes about you, something that you're afraid of happening where it's showing up in this part of your life. But if you really look at it, whatever underlining thing that is shows up in a lot of different areas of your life. 
And so, I mean, I'll just talk about myself because that's the yeah. most easy, vulnerable person to just kind of analyze. And I understand myself pretty well. For me, it's fear of not being good enough. And so when something poor happened in my practice early on, you know, either a staff member's upset about something, patient's upset, patient left, you know, patient didn't have a great experience or something happened in my personal life where somebody is upset with me for some reason, you know, wife is unhappy, anything like that. All of those things are very different areas that all told me I'm not good enough because of all of those things. And so it was this fear of not being good enough that's sort of at the root of, and it shows up and it rears its head in your life in all these different places. I think everyone has that. Yeah. And it just shows up differently. And so for me, every time I was making a decision for my practice, it was either I could make a decision from the place of what's best for the business just objectively speaking. And that's something I've, I've shown on the show. I'm fairly good at being objective, but then there is what decision am I making for my business that is like, because I don't want to not feel good enough. And they're both, I, I was always wishy washy. If didn't know what two things to do, I'd flip flop. I changed my mind because I'm going between what I know is best in my heart of hearts versus what is my fear wanting me to do. And so that book for me, that audio series really explores fear in a lot of different contexts in people's lives. And it shows techniques, tactics for di- just attacking it, getting over it, and working through it. You know, I think if someone were to look at my career, they were, they would say, man, like, that guy, he doesn't feel afraid of anything. Mm-hmm. Like, the number of things I've done in my career, you'd be like, oh, man, like, that guy, yeah, he doesn't feel fear. And it's like, kind of on the contrary, I feel it probably more than most. But... It's the ability to put it down. And, you know, you know, I was at the beginning of 2019 was my honeymoon crash. You know, that was when my practice dropped in 45K in a one month period. Yeah. 147 to 102. I think we did an episode right around then. Yeah, it was it was brutal. Yeah. You know, and that was by far the hardest period of practice ownership for me was when I thought everything was going great and I had no clue what was coming. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. And luckily with Practice by Numbers, I even saw it in December. So I knew February was coming. And January, I threw 10 grand a month in marketing. And I kept throwing 10 grand a month in marketing. And that was almost twofold. It was probably not the wisest thing to do from me owning the practice, but it was just that fear of like, if we have a bad month in February, that's going to make me feel so inadequate that I'll just do anything to not feel that. Mm. And so I just over invested in marketing for a period of time in these like really not great strategies. But if I just been calm, level headed, and been able to like digest the situation moving forward, then I probably would have made a much more sound decision, not from fear. And so in that case, fear made me take a risk, but at the same time it was a pretty dumb one. Mm. And so I, I just I am very big on the camp of who you be, and this is like not my own concept. This is very much a life coaching concept, but who you be as a leader, like your mentality, your mindset, everything you bring to the room as a leader has everything to do with the performance of your business because of all the decisions you'll make. Okay. And that's where that audiobook is huge. Um it's it's something that I think people can sense in in like where your decision making, how you're reacting to things. If your default is that anxiety or that fear, I'm I'm pretty good at uh having like crippling analysis paralysis on on decision making on stuff that like comes up in my practice they're like what do we do about this situation with this patient i'm just like uh what do you think you know like that's yeah because i have no clue uh and that's like constant i think i think that's the hardest thing about practice ownership is the decision making that comes up all the time where there's no obvious answer well and i think it's more than that i think i mean And this is where maybe the breakthrough is for a lot of our audience. You've been listening to this show for hours and hours and hours on end where people who have been very successful has told you exactly how they do it. You're not in the camp of, well, I have no clue what the successful people do. It's like, you know exactly what we do, but you're not doing it for some reason. Why? That right there, that's it. What is holding you back from doing the things you know are best, but just scare the living crap out of you. Mm -hmm. You know, that, whatever that is, that's your breakthrough. And it's your ability to confront those things that are whole, and that's really hard work. You know, I, man, I'm not going to look good on Practice Underwater in a couple weeks. I roast this upcoming guest. (laughs) The the more than I've roasted anybody, and I'm probably going to talk about him for years. His name's Albert on the show. And it was like, oh man, dude, this guy just, 
did nothing. He's owned his practice for seven years, hasn't moved it an inch. And it's just because he's just uncomfortable conversations. He's unwilling to have just simple stuff he knows he should do, but he just doesn't want to because he's afraid of upsetting staff and patients and all this stuff. And it's like, that's everything to do with your ability to just manage your fear around these few issues and just handle them. You know, the impact it has on people's lives is more than they realize until you start working through it. You're like, wow, I'm flying through my life and obstacles and I'm achieving things nobody ever thought was possible because of just a few like changes in my mindset. It's pretty incredible. Well, and a lot of times we, th- there's two sides of that. There's knowing which decisions are worth making people upset over. And then there are the ability to follow through with those decisions. So yeah. I think a lot of people, all of the decisions, because they don't have metrics, they don't have a blueprint, they don't have a coach across the board. It's like, I don't even know what to do. And if I do any of these things, team's going to be upset. Patients are going to be upset. Yeah. So then they do nothing. And that's like half of coaching is convincing the client to do the thing I'm telling them to do. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, obviously, they haven't not done it for a reason. Right. There's something they're afraid of around that issue, and you help them work through it, right? And that's the biggest benefit of coaching is that you can do that one-on-one, and you can really, you know, we can dive into their stuff and what's coming in the way and how we can help them retrain their mindset and sort of re-see things in a different light. Um, but it's it's really, you know, going back to the audio series, you know, Mel's really cool in the fact that she'll take somebody through these situations that you think are completely unrelated to yourself. Yeah. Um, but which I, is, which is what I totally thought when I was listening. Yeah. I was like, uh, I don't struggle with this issue. And but it's it's not the issue that you need to look at. It's what is behind the issue that we all have. You know, if it's like there was a ladder like mentality um, segment of the show where there's this person who walked up the steps of the career. They just went from like, you know junior partner to mid partner to senior partner. Like they just go up the ladder in a corporate job. I forgot what her job was. And that's dentistry. You go from undergrad to dental school to residency to associate to ownership. Then what? Right. You know, and that's what we do in this profession is we train that ladder like mentality. So if nothing else is relevant to the book, that chapter is, you know, was there, do you have any specific examples of, ways that you've shown up in the practice that kind of required you to get through fear to make that decision or to have a conversation? Yeah. So early in my ownership, I hygiene was an area that I tinkered with a lot. Mm. I just, hygiene was probably early on the department I was the hardest on in terms of change the most because it, it was what I focused on right away. You know, we co-diagnosed, we implemented insurance maximization. A lot of things were messing with that hygiene appointment. And the trauma that that caused me as an owner, you know, my staff being constantly upset with me, my hygienist always complaining as many tears as we had going through all that stuff. Finally, we got it to a point where it was dialed in. I was like, all right, we are not touching hygiene ever again. <laughs> and now, you know, we're doing more stuff in hygiene and every time we do something in hygiene, I have to work through that again. I'm like, okay, just put down your trauma around implementing things in hygiene and just do it. So what's something recent that you've changed in hygiene from before when we were, you know, talking about case acceptance, when we were talking about, you know, insurance maximization? What do you what have you had to change in the last three to six months? Their schedules. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we split shifted. So we moved our team from eight to five typical schedule to now we run seven to six Monday through Thursday. And now I have mornings, evenings, whole days. I have three different types of shifts for a hygienist. And if there's one thing a hygienist does not like, it's a new schedule. Mm. And, and then not on that's, I mean, most team members are that way too. Yeah. But hygiene is where my trauma is. So that was the hardest conversation for me to have was with hygiene. It was like front office, like, Oh, you're working these hours assistants. Hey, you guys are here. And then it was hygiene. It was like one-on-one meetings with each one of them. And it was really hard for me to do that. And, you know, at the same time, also not on top of that, but you know, if you work eight to five in my practice, not one hygienist still will be in her room the whole day. Um, but the other ones, they're in one room in the morning and one in the afternoon. And we're moving them around for scheduling purposes. And so that wasn't an easy, right? For me, and you might be listening to this thinking like, this is no biggie, dude. Like, No, but these, I mean, 
they're real for me. Well, and and individual team members, you know, it's like everyone's got their ways of reacting to things. Some people are like, yeah, whatever, you know, let's let's change it up. And other people are like, well, no, here's the problem with this. Or again, or you know, the decisions you make as a practice owner affect people's day to day life. Yeah, and and it's not always a positive response that you're getting. And you feel like as as the leader of the practice, it is your job. You are your client, the person I serve before anyone else, including myself, is the practice. Mm. What is best for the practice? And doing that, I opened up... Tw- so we had so we have five hygienists now, and we're out of space. Just totally out of space. And so I had to open up more capacity. But my only way of doing that was shifting around the hygiene schedule. Mm. And you might be looking at me like, I'm in year two, I'm out of capacity. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're in the process of figuring out a more long-term solution to that situation. Right. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, I'm, I'm buying myself a year by adding an extra 25% of my hygiene capacity by moving around schedules and split shifting and doing the seven to six. So then we're running, you know, 12 hours a day of hygiene per op. And and we, we kind of, when you say it like, oh, I, this is what we did. Even though you had to, you broke through that fear and that anxiety, it probably, that conversation did probably not land well initially. No. I mean, yeah. Well, why can't we just keep it the same? You know, well, you know, yeah, it, it wasn't easy. Um, but you have to work through that because you work for the practice and the practice needs what the practice needs. And that's not really up for debate. Like you can debate it, but you're just trying to talk yourself out of something uncomfortable at the end of the day. Right. It was very clear as day. And this is a huge thanks to our mastermind group and Alex Sharp. He was the one that told me, this is where you're at. This is what you need. Mm. And I didn't even want to see it because of how afraid I was of dealing with it. Interesting. So, I mean, the fear is big. It, it blocks your eyes from not looking at it. And then you don't want to actually do it. Right. And so, you know, having Alex tell me like, nope, map it out. And I'm like, Alex, I don't think this is going to do anything, but let me map it out anyway. And then I mapped it out. I was like 23.9% increase in capacity. I was like, okay. I'm in. <laughs> and it was like a gut, you know, tight chest right when I realized I have to do that because I was like, how am I going to tell everybody this? Oh, I mean, I have anxiety thinking about if I had to tell my team that. Like, yeah. Oh. I mean, I have, and right, they they don't have lunch together anymore. Like, right. it, it, you it's, know, it's been a nine to five practice forever. They always do a lunch thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, eight to five, eight to five, seven to four, seven to four. And now we're seven to six, seven to six, seven to six, seven to six. I have doctors there at different times, assistants there at different times, front office there at three different times. You know, we're completely different scheduling wise now. You know, and it it had to happen, but you know, that was that's very real fear and anxiety going through that. Well, and I'm I mean, my biggest thing is like people have daycare, people have like arrangements for, you know, family stuff and all of that. And and now you're asking another hour of people in the evening or, you know, maybe they're getting an earlier out but they have to be there earlier in the morning and dropping kids off and so you know these are real decisions well and the whole thing's a negotiation right you sit down with each staff member everyone has their preferences some like to sleep in some like to wake up early some you know can't do an evening some would rather have the day off some would you know everyone has their different stuff right and so you sit down with all of them you say of my existing team and the earlier you do this probably the better i probably waited a little bit too long you know but you all sit down and you sort of make it a win-win-ish you know, and it's funny because we we had a staff meeting last week and we did a poll of like, who's excited about the new schedule? About everyone, I think about 80% of people said they are excited for the new schedule. Okay. So. In the end. In the end, yeah, it, it's a win-win. But the process of getting there is, the, the first instinct is, oh, I'm excited. That was not the case. They're not initially excited about the new schedule. You have to push through that and make it happen. And find and, a way to make it work. And yeah, find a way to negotiate with them and, you know, um sort of do what you have to do to get the thing that the practice needs. That's your job as a leader. And I think that, I don't know if that's been said a lot in the season, but I genuinely view my job as the leader of the practice to what does the practice need? That's what I have to do. And not thinking about it as like, what do I want? It's like, well, what I want doesn't matter. Mm. It's what what's best for the practice. And it's a very, very usually it's not what I want. Like a lot. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. And, and I think that most dentists would rather just not think about the things that they don't want to do. Yeah. Which which is, like you said, what coaching is, is, is helping people see what they need to do and then convincing them to actually do it. 
But if you look at my practice, not having that conversation, how much is it costing me? How much in revenue is it costing my practice to not have that extra 24% capacity? It's huge. Yeah, I mean, we're talking, you know, million dollars a year. Like, yeah. Is So you're not having a conversation for a million dollars a year. Yeah. Right, all of a sudden the conversation feels like, okay, maybe I'll just have the conversation. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think when you really, and this was something I got from coaching, you know, from Justin was, how much is this thing in dollars costing you? Mm. Not that mindset, you know, and pushing through that. And it makes it easier to to get behind the, you know, the philosophy of, okay, I just have to do it. And, but again, if you're not able to sit with your fear and move through it, then none of this matters. This whole conversation is you like, ah, oh, split shifting would never work in my practice. You know, my team's too established. We're an established practice. We don't do split shifting here. Right. And it's like, you would just find a reason to make it feel like it's not your thing, so you could just get out of it. Right. You don't even have to confront that. Yeah, you don't have to confront it, but that's not what the practice needs. That's not what's best for the practice. And being able to manage your fear and anxiety is what pushes you through that. Hmm. I'm going to bring my Mel Robbins book to the table. Perfect. So Mel Robbins has another book, which she's way more well known for this book. This is like, I've never heard of this book. It's the five second rule. It's a book you can summarize. It's in about like, eating stuff off the floor? Y- yes. <laughs> she, she, she actually makes fun of herself in the book for uh, coming up with the five second rule. That's because, hilarious. Because it is like a whole bunch of other dumb things. It's, yeah. not, it's not what you'd think it is. But essentially it's whenever you don't want to do something, count down from five and make yourself do it when you get to one. So Interesting. She was like depressed. They were like upside down on like as a mom, they were like upside down on a business, uh, like close to bankrupt, um, career kind of falling through. And she like couldn't get out of bed, you know, like kids late to school, like all this, this crap. Like she just was depressed. She was in a bad spot. And this thing popped into her head. If I just go five, four, three, two, one. And, and when you get to one, you stand up, you, you start moving. Oh, that's so cool. And and it's, you wouldn't think. She wrote a whole book about counting down from five? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you wouldn't think you could write an entire book about counting down from five. But so it's like can. chapter one, five, <laughs> chapter two, four. It's a short book. Is it six chapters? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's it's actually a really good book. The last page is zero. It, it's not going to, for people who are like, annoyed by self-help books that seem like common sense this would definitely be a book that would annoy you yeah uh but the but it works like when you are avoiding procrastinating depressed stressed out and there's just something that you need to be doing that you're not doing just starting that counter at five by the time you get to one you're like okay fine i'll do the friggin thing and you get up and you and you get it done um and pushing through similar veins as, as her, you know, coaching that she talks about later of feeling emotions and doing stuff anyways. Yeah. Um, I think that's a common theme uh, and, and probably a lot of what her, her life coaching and all of that centers around. But um, for me, uh, I'm trying to think when I listened to this book, it was in Oklahoma. So when I was at Fort Sill and I, I don't think it was immediately like pulling me out of a funk at that time. But there are definitely been times in my life where I, I spend so much more time avoiding stuff than actually getting it done. Yeah. Um, George just delegates this. You, you're, you're the king of like, if there's something in my life that's draining me of energy. And, and actually, so I've hired a coach around uh, the Getting Things Done system by David Allen. Oh, so cool. GTD Focus, I had my first session with her, uh, Meg... Edwards, she's the president of GTD Focus, and they're like the one-on-one coaches for getting things done. And um, one of the things she talked about was for your personality and for the things that you do, there's going to be an energy cost for certain things. Yes. And for different people, that's going to be different. For her, she talked about, for instance, um, reading like a long legal document. She's like, I can get that done 
but the energy cost is very high Mm -hmm. versus someone who can just like sit down and like pound through it. She's like, I have to like read it in chunks. I'll like read the first bit and then I need to get up and walk away. So when you commit to things for your personality, stuff that is high energy cost for you, either it has to really be worth it or you delegate it or get someone else to do it. Um, Because otherwise it's like, yes, I can get this done. If I commit to this, I can technically get this done. But at what cost? Yeah, that's huge. Um, and that was a big breakthrough for me because th- I do stuff all the time and I commit to stuff that I feel like, no, I should do this. Uh, like for instance, uh, editing this other side podcast that I won't mention who it's for my day job, uh, is a thing that I've committed. I forgot how much time, effort and work editing a podcast is editing a podcast is You're shout welcome. out to John and Gary. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, seriously. Thank you guys. So much work. Um, and and, it, and for me, it's a very high cost thing. Yeah. Um, but it was originally when when I started shared practices, I cared enough, and I wanted it to be so good that even though the cost was high, I, w- I was able to do it. Um, but I realized I couldn't do this as a job, um, and so I, I've now taken on a large project where I'm editing, you know, ten hours of audio on our first season of this other little side thing I'm doing. Um, and and the cost is really high and realizing okay i need to not commit myself to do that again yeah um so there there's a lot of things that come out of that but um another thing that's come out of this coaching so this is a little side tangent to the 5 second rule um is that i there's this personality preference some people are like sequential per- personality preference so that when they're doing something they just want to start at the beginning power through get it done other people are associative they like to just like brainstorm and like let's look at a bunch of different ideas and, and, and um, not really be sequential about how they're thinking about how they're, how they're doing things. I scored right on the middle of the profile between sequential and associative. And she said, that's like 4% of people is like dual preference. And she's like, for us, um, you, you kind of want to not max out either side. So if you're like a doing nice balance. a balance and, and so like if I'm r- processing my emails that's a really taxing thing for me and I can get it done for a while, but like I'm spent after like an, an hour or half an hour of like trying to get through my emails. Like I'm, I'm dead. I need to go do something else. And I used to have this expectation in my head of like, sometimes I can focus and power through stuff and it's not a big deal. And other times it's really, really hard and I can't make myself do it. And I'm confused by that and frustrated by that because in my mind, I'm like, I've done this before. Why is this a big deal right now? Um, And realizing that it's like, no, that's okay. You're going to fatigue on doing certain types of things. I just have to get up and go do something else. Come back to it later. And that's not a sign that I've like failed to like stay on track or stay on focus with something I need to get done. It's just my preference. It's just who you are. It's who who I am. Yeah. Um, So I just one one session so far. I've already had some like breakthrough things of like, oh, okay, this this is different for me. Um, so this has been a good episode. This can I add something, please? So, um, in the, another one of the audio series books, you reminded me of it when you talked about the energy cost, energy drain is Mel has you listen to energy draining versus energy giving tasks Mm. to sort of learn to follow your passion. So there's one of the people on there, you know, likes wine and wasn't sure if he wants to open up his own wine bar. And she was sort of coaching him on the idea of like, just learn more about what you like, Mm. you know, maybe get a job in wine and see how you feel. And so, I think that that idea of, and that's sort of been my philosophy for a long time. I actually got that from the book the first time around was, you know, what things in my life give me energy and what things in my life take energy away and that energy cost, the high energy cost activities are things I typically delegate. And then the energy giving activities are the things that I just fill my schedule with more so that by the end of the day of working, I'm actually like super jazzed and excited by the end as opposed to like, oh, I'm exhausted. I need to go home and like have a drink. Totally. Yeah. Uh, and for you, that's dentistry, apparently. Yeah, definitely. No, dentistry is an energy drain for me, big time. For me, it's writing notes post-patient care. Oh, yeah. That's like 10 steps behind. Yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> that was never a part of me doing dentistry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You've got great assistants, great templates. It, <laughs> it all works out. Um, that, uh, yeah, and, and I don't know how much... I know on air you're going to talk about a little bit more about some of your journey and decision-making recently with the practice. Um, I guess you've talked about it on... Um, dental Friends with Benefits? Dental Friends with Benefits. Yeah, no, I yeah, I, I stepped away clinically. Yeah. Yeah. George fired George. 
Yeah, so I, I told my team, George, the owner, is firing George Dennis. Yeah. So now you are clinical ha- half a day a week? So I'm there uh, uh, Wednesdays between 12 and 4. Okay. And from 12 to 1, I have a departmental meeting. So one of my departments in my practice were doing a meeting. And then from 1 to 4, it's only patients that specifically request me will get on my schedule. So we just block that time. If anybody insists on seeing me, then we have three hours a week that we're, you know, are there. But it's not like three hours a week for George to produce a week's worth of production. It's like the daily goal is zero. <laughs> and my preference is that nobody's on the schedule. But if somebody <laughs> happens to be on the schedule, I will do it. Um, uh, so you're you're now beating me by one hour. So I've got four hours of clinical a week. You're at three. I'm at three. Nice. Well done. And it's funny. It'll and then my staff's like, I wonder when that's gonna stop. Now they know, you know, they're like, I went from, you know, three and a half days to three days to two days to now a half day. And like, when is it like a half day a month? And they're like, I don't know. We'll see when, but probably at some point. (laughs) And, and, and more fun to come. Yeah. But I think that's just listening to what gives me energy and fuel and being at the practice, seeing patients, isn't it? But owning the practice and managing the team and growing it and, you know, departmental meetings and all those things. I love that. Absolutely. So I'm not going to stop doing that. I'm not going to sell my practice. I'm just going to position my my role in my practice to do things that are I'm meant to do, not things I'm trained to do. So the question is, do we need to have another episode to wrap up this season? I think season five is done. This is it? Yeah. Okay. I think it's season six intro coming up. Okay. So. Oh, wait. The surprise? Are going to tell them? Let's tell them. We've had a little bit of a like a podcast episode divorce. You know, for a while, it was like you and I, and we were... We were always doing stuff together, and then it became this like we only saw each other twice a year type thing. Podcasting. Well, I started podcasting with Matt. You did. You've been podcasting around and with Ashley. Yeah. So I've, I've been, uh, I've been. Anyway, so you've been seeing other podcasters. Yeah, I've been seeing other podcasters, and so <laughs> season six of the Shared Practices podcast is me and Richard. Yeah, we're gonna be back at it. I'm so excited. So this this is a season we've been both avoiding and looking forward to yeah. at the same time. Uh, we've been avoiding it because the, the the risk of us getting this wrong is pretty high. Um, initially, we were going to call this a season on marketing. Correct. And Tyler, shout out Tyler Tolbert, uh, said... "What You if, got his last name right, man. Uh, what if we change that around and and called that growth? Growth. Such, and, such a better concept. Yeah. Because marketing is just like, okay, a bunch of different ways to promote your practice. Yeah, but that's not a season. And that's a piece of growth. Right. There's a a whole nother, I mean, growth is so much more than just marketing. uh, Should we grow? And how do we grow? And where do we grow? And and what kind of patients are we trying to bring in? And preparing for that growth and dealing with growth when it happened too fast. And, um, and, And this is something that you have personally been through yourself a yeah. ton of, and then you've coached people through this a ton of. Yeah, I mean, we're very much, our coaching is very much a growth-based model. Yeah. So a, a dentist who doesn't want to grow their practice isn't really an ideal client for us. No. Our coaching department is very much geared towards growing practices, especially to larger groups or larger solos, a solo that isn't doing a million to a solo doing a million or somebody that's, you know, solo doing a million to somebody doing two million with an associate. Like that's that's what our coaching does. And so it's very much up our alley growth. I think somebody was like, oh, I just want to kind of stay what I'm doing and just have a little bit more organized lifestyle, make a little bit more money. That's not an ideal client for us. No. And and that's good for us to know and for them to know that it's like we're not the just get a little bit more organized you can you can step away like you're doing yeah because you've grown yourself well, that's, a, that's a form of growth is cutting your time right yeah uh so this is gonna be good i'm excited uh season six richard and george let's do it okay